Uh, welcome everyone. I hope you're having uh, an awesome winter conference. My name is Rosemary Malfi. I'm the Pollinator Network Coordinator at NOFA Mass. You are attending Vegetable Pests of the Year with Genevieve Higgins. And uh, I will introduce our speaker shortly, but before we jump in, I have a few details to review with you. Oh, here we go. The first is that uh, NOFA Mass is strengthening our commitment to racial equity and justice by examining whiteness and dismantling systems of white supremacy that are part of many dominant systems used, including our agriculture and food systems. We also want to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge and honor the indigenous land stewards who are the original occupants of the land on which we are currently living, farming and residing. There is a link at the bottom of the screen. Um, we're also gonna put that in the chat and we encourage you to go to that link and find your area and to identify the original stewards of those lands. We also want to call everyone, uh, especially white allies to action on a few items to assist BIPOC led organizations. Those actions are listed on the slides. I'm just gonna take a beat so you can kind of read through those. And I wanna let you know that there are two events taking place. Uh, one is for Spanish speakers and one is for BIPOC members. And uh, the information for those events is on the screen. Uh, you can also find that in the program. I think everyone's familiar with Zoom etiquette by now, but we're, we're gonna go over that anyway. Um, the account is set to mute participants upon entry, so everyone should be muted. During uh, Q&A um, parts of the talk, you are welcome. You, to put your questions in the chat, but you can unmute yourself using the microphone button. So you just click that, you'll speak. And then we ask that you please, again, mute yourself so that we don't create background noise for other people speaking. Um, again, uh, you can always put your questions into the chat. So uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that. And uh, what I encourage folks to do is sort of ask questions as they come to you, and then we can always scroll back through them and um, I can relay them to Genevieve. And of, of course, the session is being recorded. Uh, we have many um, sponsors who may help make our conference possible, and I encourage you to purchase from them. And when you do, to let them know that you appreciate their support of NOFA Mass. Uh, here are some of our sponsors. Here are some more. Thank you to all of them. We also have some really incredible items to bid on in our online auction. Uh, you can visit the link that appears at the bottom of the screen. We're also going to be dropping that in the chat, or you can text NOFA NOFA to 855-202-2100 to see the lineup of items. We also want to encourage you to explore the virtual vendor marketplace where there is a lot of great information and some generous discount codes for conference attendees. Most importantly, we want to thank all of you for spending your weekend with us and especially NOFA members who make our education and advocacy work possible. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Genevieve, you can start sharing yours and I will introduce our speaker. Uh, our speaker is Genevieve Higgins, who is an extension educator with the UMass Extension Vegetable Program. Her work with the vegetable program is aimed at supporting commercial vegetable production in Massachusetts and includes conducting applied research trials on crop and pest management practices, co-editing the vegetables notes newsletter, and consulting with farmers on crop and pest management issues. And with that, I turn it over to you, Genevieve. Great, thank you so much, Rosemary. Uh, can you, you're seeing the right screen? Sounds good. All right, hi to everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming, really appreciate it. Um, like Rosemary said, my name is Genevieve Higgins. I'm an extension educator with the UMass Vegetable Program. And uh, today I'm gonna be talking about vegetable pests of the year. Um, I had planned to maybe go around and do some um, introductions with everyone here, but there's quite a number of you in the meeting, so. I'm not going to do that today, but just briefly about myself and the vegetable program. Um, we do primarily work with commercial vegetable producers, and our, our main goal is to, um, to provide research-based education um, as well as applied research trials um, for the benefit of commercial vegetable production in Massachusetts. Um, but I know that there's definitely a lot of attendees to, to this conference and members of NOFA who are maybe smaller scale growers, so I'm going to do my best to remember <laughs> to suggest control options for some of the pests I'm going to talk about for some smaller scale, maybe home garden size um, production systems. And because this is NOFA, um, I'm definitely only going to be talking about organic chemical control. I will be mentioning some chemical control. Um, in general, we, we do work with organic and conventional growers, but 
going to limit it to organic controls um, in this talk. Um, also, before I get started, I'm going to say up front, there's a lot of information in this presentation. Had a little bit of trouble reeling myself in. <laughs> um, so I know you guys are going to be given access to my slide doc. Um, and I wanted to say this up front so people don't get overwhelmed maybe with the amount of information. Part of my goal with this presentation um, was to provide you guys with like an overview of many of the pests that you might see in vegetable crops in your production systems. So you might not remember every detail of every pest that I go through today, but hopefully you'll have something in the back of your memory so that next season when you're looking at your tomatoes and you see something funky, you say, oh, maybe that was mentioned in that talk and you can go back and look at the slides um, and have some pointers about where to go from there. So don't get overwhelmed, that's the take home there. <laughs> um, this is just a brief overview of what I'm gonna go through today. So uh, a very brief overview of some of the types of pests that you might see in vegetable crops. Um, and then we'll go through some of the main crop groups of uh, vegetables. So brassicas, nightshades, and cucurbits, um, and then some miscellaneous crops. Um, and then at the end, I'll go through some resources for pest identification. And within each of those crop groups that I'll go through, um, I'll talk about some of the important pests that we see year after year without fail, um, as well as in a few cases, some new pests that are showing up in the region to keep an eye out for. Um, and I'll mention some pest management for each pest as I go through it, but mostly at the end of each crop section, I'll go over some overarching pest management recommendations for that crop group. <clears throat> so before I get into that, that main outline, just very briefly, why does pest identification and management matter? Obviously, the most obvious answer is that everyone here, everyone who grows crops wants to be able to produce high quality food, whether you're growing on 500 acres or growing on half an acre or 100 square feet. <clears throat> but there's some other things that also um, come into play. There are certain pests um, that are monitored either just in the Northeast or along the Eastern coast or across the country. Um, those are usually either emerging pests that are new to a region and we want to track where they're showing up. <clears throat> um, or they're migratory pests that move annually into a region. Um, and we want to be able to give growers heads up to be ready for a pest to arrive. There's also this concept of community-wide pest management, where for certain pests, um, if all vegetable growers, from large-scale commercial growers to home gardeners, can successfully um, control a pest, then they uh, then the, that pressure, disease pressure or insect pressure will be lower for everyone. So this kind of community approach um, to controlling pests can be uplifting and encouraging. <laughs> um, it's also really important to know when to spend time and money um, on things like pesticides or even just time consuming um, cultural practices. There are, especially for home, home gardeners, um, there are still pesticides and organic approved pesticides available. Um, they're often fairly low concentrations of those active ingredients and they can be pretty pricey um, and not super effective. So it's good to know what pests um, it's worth spending money on for pesticides and which ones you might wanna skip and focus on some other tactics. And then again, with those pesticides, there's definitely um, issues with, with pests developing resistance to some chemicals um, and other environmental impacts that I'm sure you guys are aware of, um, where you wanna make sure if you're using pesticides, you wanna be doing it safely and responsibly. And that um, involves understanding what pests you have, getting correct identification, and make sure you're using the pesticides um, as efficiently as possible. <clears throat> so every year we see um, a wide range of pests and the patterns of what we see and when tend to vary with the growing season. <clears throat> so last year, or I'll, I'll just make a few points about last year's growing season. Um, we did have an abnormally warm and dry spring. So this map on the left um, is showing the average temperature departure from normal um, for the month of March. And those various shades of pink are representing one to seven degrees warmer than normal um, in March. So it was warm and dry in the spring. Folks got excited about planting. <laughs> People planted out into the field. And then a lot of the plants just kind of sat there and we saw a lot of issues um, with plants struggling to take off in some cool 
um, some cool soils. But mostly, as you all know, it was very wet. <laughs> so this other map, um, it shows the departure from normal of precipitation in inches. And you can see most of the map is various shades of green. And that um, is representing uh, six to 10 or more inches than normal um, of rain in for July. That map is for July. So July, we had almost 270% of normal precipitation, which I'm sure you guys all experienced <laughs> and saw how crazy it was. August was still wet, almost 150% of normal precipitation. So in terms of pests, it was a year for plant diseases. Um, as I'll explain on the next slide, a lot of plant diseases love it when it's wet. <laughs> they really thrive in that environment. Um, so while we had insect pests for sure, um, it was definitely a year for plant diseases. <clears throat> um, so here's all the different types of pests you might see in vegetable crops. As I said, last year was really a year for diseases. Um, plant diseases can be caused by fungi. Um, so it can cause a wide variety of symptoms, leaf and fruit spots and blights. Uh, the fungi, certain fungi can get into the vascular system of plants um, and cause wilt um, and plant death. Spores are usually spread by wind, um, sometimes by equipment and people moving in fields, sometimes by water. Um, and as I said before, most like um, that warm, wet weather that we had this summer. Um, there's another group of organisms called oomycetes um, that are very similar to fungi. We call them fungal-like organisms. Um, they function basically exactly like fungi, but they're genetically different. They evolved from algae, so they're um, more related to plants than fungi, actually. <clears throat> um, and there's several really important oomycete pathogens of vegetable crops. Um, if you're controlling or for conventional growers who are using conventional um, pesticides, um, there's some important distinctions between the pesticides that work for these two groups. But if you're not if you're not using pesticides at all, or or, or even if you're using organic pesticides, um, basically it's just a fun factoid <laughs> to know that some of them are actually oomycetes. Uh, bacteria can also cause plant diseases. Um, again, they can cause leaf and fruit spots. They can cause vac vascular diseases. Um, bacteria are primarily moved in water. Um, and again, they like that warm, wet weather. Um, and interestingly, bacteria uh, need a wound or an entry point to get into a plant. Um, so that can be oftentimes it's wounds caused by cultivation. Um, if you're cultivating with a tractor, it can be wounds caused by insect feeding damage, um, things like that. So compared to fungi, fun a fungal spore can land on a plant leaf and germinate just all by itself and get into that plant. But a bacteria needs, a, needs an entry point, of an opening in the plant to enter. <clears throat> um, viruses can also cause plant diseases. I'm not gonna talk about any viruses today, but I wanted to mention them. Um, and importantly, many viruses are vectored by different insects, um, which are of course another very important pest of vegetable crops. Obviously, veg uh, insects eat vegetable crops, they eat the plants. Um, there's many insect pests of vegetable crops that are migratory. <clears throat> so they overwinter outside of the Northeast and then move into the region every year. Um, but there's also many that overwinter up here um, and emerge um, from their overwintering sites as soon as it gets warm enough in the spring. Um, and as I said before, with the viruses, many insects will vector uh, diseases. And then the last group of pests um, is a big one, which is weeds. I'm not going to be talking at all about weeds today, but they're definitely considered a pest. They, they do negatively impact um, crop production, um, but it's a whole other topic, weeds. <laughs> okay, so that brings us to our first crop group. Um, I'm going to be talking about brassicas first. Um, here's a list of the different pests I'm going to talk about. I won't read through it because we'll go through them all, but we'll talk about some pests that we see every year. Um, as well as a new pest that's emerging in the region, uh, Swede midge. And then at the end of the section, I'll talk about some overarching pest management recommendations. <clears throat> so the first pest I'll talk about is probably one of the most prevalent and common uh, insect pests of brassicas that we have, and that is flea beetles. They're super common. If you grow brassicas, you have likely seen a flea beetle or many of them. 
They have chewing mouth parts, so they chew on the leaves and eat the leaves. They prefer non-waxy brassicas, so things like arugula, mustard greens, bok choy, like you can see in that picture below. Um, they do also feed on waxy brassicas, like you can see in the picture above. Um, and in waxy brassicas, things like cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, kale, um, in those waxy brassicas, they are most damaging to young plants, so that, that young, tender foliage. <clears throat> the adults will overwinter in field edges, so they do stay in the northeast throughout the year. Um, and then in the spring, usually around late April, depending on the year, the adults will emerge from the field edges and go find some brassica crops to, to feed on. They lay their eggs in the soil and the larvae feed on brassica roots. They don't usually do much damage, um, but they're down there. <clears throat> and there are two different species. Um, there's a normal crucifer uh, flea beetle, and then there's this striped flea beetle, has some yellow on it, and you might see them uh, both in the same crop. Um, I'll talk about some cultural control recommendations at the end of this section, um, but for those of you who do use um, who do use pesticides to control pests on your farm, um, the most effective chemical control um, is spinosad, most commonly seen as Entrust is the um, product name. There's also a material called Surround, which is kale and clay, um, and that is just a physical deterrent um, to the flea beetles. They don't like landing on it, they don't like chewing on it, so you can apply it to um, especially like young transplants and it'll deter the beetles. It does wash off of the plants. So you can see the picture of kale in the upper right hand corner that's um, surround applied on that kale plant. Um, so it'll wash off in the rain. So you do have to reapply after rain. And you also have to reapply to protect any new foliage that wasn't hadn't grown yet when you applied. Um, so you can see in that picture, there's some young leaves at the bottom that uh, weren't there when, when this was applied. <clears throat> Next up is caterpillars, which are a close, they're, they're, the same, they're always all around as well, the same as flea beetles. There's four caterpillar pests of brassicas. Um, I'll briefly go through each of them. Um, imported cabbage worm, which is the first one here, um, is the one that we see most early in the season. So it'll show up in mid-June. Um, there's the caterpillar on top there. They're kind of fuzzy looking. Um, they like to hang out in the mid-rib of, uh, of brassica leaves, and they're very well camouflaged sometimes. Um, they, their eggs are laid um, singly, so one by one, not, not in clusters, usually on the undersides of leaves. Um, and the picture in the bottom left there is a pupa, and that's the stage that overwinters here in the northeast. <clears throat> and then there's a picture of the butterfly as well. Um, and they're very common to see flitting around in both brassica fields, but also just all over the place. They're very common. This is a cabbage looper. Um, they're a little bit less common, but they'll show up later in the season, maybe in mid-July. And this is the only one of the brassica caterpillars that moves like an inchworm. The other ones just crawl. This guy is diamondback moth. Um, and there's a few notable things to help distinguish this guy. Um, the caterpillars, uh, when they feed, they usually are on the undersides of the leaves and they don't eat all the way through the top layer of the leaf. So they leave behind this transparent film um, or layer of, of leaf tissue. We call that window pane damage. You can see that in the picture on the top there. Uh, the caterpillars also have a little forked tail. So if you look at their tail end, they have two little protrusions. Um, and when you bother the caterpillars on, on the leaf, they'll wriggle really wildly. Um, and usually they'll drop off of the leaf on a little thread. Um, so that's one way that you can figure out that they're diving back moths. Um, the second picture there is a pupa. They form this really delicate um, structure around their pupae. And then at the bottom is a moth. The moths fly at night, so they're not seen that often and they're pretty small. Um, but sometimes you'll see them hanging out on the leaves. And then lastly is the cross-striped cabbage worm. These guys look quite different from the others because they have that yellow and green striping on them. And the other thing that distinguishes these guys is they lay their eggs um, in clusters. So you can see the egg mass below. They look kind of like fish scales. They're all these overlapping um, eggs in a pile. So when they hatch from an egg cluster, you have a bunch of caterpillars all on one plant. And you can see in the picture on the bottom there, they can really rip through a plant in a short amount of time. 
And often you'll see it where one plant will be totally destroyed and the next plant over might not have any of these guys on it at all. <clears throat> um, if you are using chemical control uh, for these guys, there is a there are BT products, so that's Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, which is a bacterium that produces uh, a toxin that targets um, the gut of like the digestive tract of caterpillars. So it's targeted to caterpillars. It doesn't affect other types of insects, and it must be eaten to to work. So in that way, it targets <clears throat> uh, only caterpillars that are feeding on your brassica crop. Um, so it's very targeted. It has very little effect on other um, insects that might be around. Um, and the most common formulation of that is called Dipel. <clears throat> okay, um, I think this is the last brassica insect pest I'll talk about, and that is cabbage aphids. Um, so cabbage aphids, they can cause this uh, leaf yellowing and distortion, but mostly the issue with cabbage aphids is their physical presence. Um, they form these really big colonies, um, and if it's on the part of your crop that you're trying to sell uh, or eat yourself, um, it's gross. <laughs> um, they're the worst on waxy, long season brassicas, um, so especially things like Brussels sprouts that are in the ground for a really long time. Um, and in Brussels sprouts, they tend to get into the buds um, and it's just gross. Um, they will overwinter on your crop residues um, and on any brassica weeds that are around. Um, and then in the spring, they'll colonize new brassica crops. Um, the colonies are primarily females and they mostly re reproduce asexually. So they just pop out clones of themselves over and over really fast. <clears throat> um, and when that colony gets too big, when they outgrow the leaf, um, then winged aphids will form. So there's a picture of a winged aphid down below. They look pretty similar to a fruit fly, about that same size. And they they don't really fly. They're not great at actually flying, but they kind of get blown in the wind um, and find new brassica crops to colonize. Um, they usually show up in crops in the early summer, usually in pretty low levels. Um, and often they go undetected unless you're really checking for them intentionally. Um, until the later summer um, when the populations have exploded um, and often it's quite difficult to control them at that point. <clears throat> um, if you're using chemical control, there has been some research, or not some, pretty extensive research <laughs> done at the University of New Hampshire as well as by us on the UMass Vegetable Program um, that has found that um, insecticidal soap, so for example, the product Impede um, and or azadiractin which there's many different formulations of that. Um, azadractin is an insect growth regulator, so it prevents insects from moving on to their next um, growth stage. So insecticidal soap and or azadractin in alternation with each other or mixed in the same tank, um, that does the best job controlling uh, cabbage aphids. So now onto a few different um, diseases of brassica pests. The first one um, is probably the most common disease of brassicas that we have. I'm sure you've seen it if you grow brassica crops. Um, it's alternaria leaf spot and crown rot. It is caused by a fungus. As the name suggests, uh, it causes leaf spots um, and they, that can lead to pretty severe defoliation. Um, and uh, if in heading brassica crops like broccoli and cauliflower, it can get into the head and cause crown rot. So that's a picture of down below of that. Um, notably, uh, there's, there's lots of different species of alternaria, the fungus that causes this one, um, and different species infect different, um, different crops. So there's an alternaria that infects tomatoes that we'll talk about in a second. Um, all alternarias share some characteristics, which is that they tend to produce leaf spots that have concentric rings. So they expand in these kind of concentric rings, giving the spots um, a target spot kind of look. And often the center of that spot will fall out. Um, and that's what we call a shot hole appearance. Looks like the leaf has been shot with a bullet. <clears throat> and you can see that in that photo that just popped up there. Um, alternaria will overwinter again in your crop residue. Um, and then in the spring, it's splashed into new plants with, uh, with rain. And then during the season, it spreads around 
with splashing water, by wind, by people and equipment moving through fields, um, and also by flea beetles. The spores kind of get tangled up in the flea beetles and they move them around. Um, and the spores can also be carried on seed. The disease prefers cool, wet weather. So we most often see this disease most severely in the fall when we start to get um, like long dewy nights. <clears throat> and it's, it's a hard one to control with, with fungicides. Um, we haven't found any effective OMRI listed um, fungicides that, that, have, that are effective against Alternaria. Oh, and I have to mention this. So I'm a plant pathologist by training. So this is my favorite part. But if you look at one of these um, spots under the microscope, this is what you'll see. This is the leaf surface with little spores standing upright. You can see that the spores um, are dark colored, which protects them from UV radiation. And they have these long tails. I think that's actually alternary on carrots, but I won't tell if you won't tell. Then if you look at those spores under the microscope, this is what the spores look like themselves. And as my plant pathology professor likes to say, those look like the Michelin man, which doesn't, it's a bummer when you get disease in your crop. At least, at least it's nice to know what they look like and to be able to remember that's the Michelin man one. <laughs> so with that, this is the uh, second plant disease that I'll talk about in brassicas. <clears throat> this is black rot. So black rot is caused by a bacterium. Um, the bacterium will overwinter in crop residue um, and it can be carried on the seed. Um, and then in this season, it enters plants um, through hydathodes, which are tiny pores along the edge of a leaf. It's kind of like the ends of the vascular system, the ends of the veins. Um, so the bacteria can get into those pores um, and enter the plant in that way. It causes these very characteristic V-shaped lesions along the edge of the leaf. So where it's wide at the edge of the leaf and then narrows down towards the center. And often the veins of that lesion um, will turn black. So you can see that in the top right hand corner. Um, and that's why it has the name black rot. <clears throat> um, and the wilting and, and uh, blighting is caused by the bacteria like growing within the vascular system of the plant um, and clogging it. Um, so if you are using chemical control, um, copper applied early and often can control this one. Um, it does need to be applied um, like as soon as you start to see symptoms or even earlier. So it can be tricky, but copper is the most effective. And before I get into some broader management recommendations, um, this is a new pest that we're seeing in brassicas called Swede midge. Um, it's fairly widespread in New York um, and also in Northwest Vermont. And it's been reported kind of in bits and pieces throughout the rest of New England. Um, this is a fly pest. So there's a picture of the adult fly there. They're super tiny. Um, and they prefer um, to lay their eggs in uh, certain brassica crops. So broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, and collards. Um, so the adults come and lay their eggs in the growing point of the brassica crop or the brassica plant. Um, and the larvae will feed within that growing point. Um, and their feeding damage causes kind of this distortion of the plant. So it can cause puckering or twisting of the leaves like you can see in the bottom uh, right-hand corner there. Um, it can cause scarring like you can see above that on the stems. Um, and it can cause these funky symptoms called blind heading where the growing point of the plant just disappears and the plant doesn't have a growing point anymore. And it can also cause multiple heads to form. <clears throat> um, so, and they're, they're tricky to identify and to confirm. Um, oftentimes these symptoms that I just described, um, they don't show up until after those larvae have already fallen to the soil to pupate. Um, so by the time you're seeing symptoms, it's hard to always confirm that it has been caused by the sweet midge. But there's multiple generations per year so this guy is active mid-May through early October. It's basically most of the growing season for brassicas. Um, <clears throat> and there have been some, some uh, a few research trials, um, I believe by Cornell, looking at uh, chemical controls. They have found that um, surround, that white kaolin clay, will deter sweet midge, so that's great. Um, and then Entrust and Azadirachtin 
have um, in some cases shown to be effective, um, not always. But that brings us to some just general overarching brassica pest management recommendations that will apply for, for most of these pests. Um, something that a lot of folks are already doing, but is sometimes hard to do in a home garden scale, um, is crop rotation. <clears throat> so that, that means both rotating between, uh, between your seasons. So you don't want to put your spring brassicas where your fall brassicas were the year before, but also within seasons. So if you have multiple successions of cabbage, for example, um, you don't want to put them in one bed, one bed, one bed, one bed. You want to spread them out so that the pests can't just move from bed to bed, easy peasy. Um, you want to make sure that you're starting with clean transplants. Um, I mentioned that several of those plant diseases can be um, carried on seed, and that can lead to having infected transplants. Um, so if you're buying in transplants or growing your own transplants, either way, before you plant them out into, into your garden or field, um, take a look and make sure that they look healthy and vigorous. <clears throat> um, avoiding working in fields or in your garden uh, when foliage is wet is always a good idea um, to avoid spreading plant diseases around. Um, and then for the insects, most of the insects that I mentioned can be excluded with row cover. There, there are spun bound row covers that um, are very fine and will exclude almost all insects. Um, they also trap heat. So they're great tools for using early in the season to push things along when it's cold. Um, but you don't always want that heat in the midsummer when it's already too hot. So there are insect nettings. Um, you can see in the top right picture there, um, a little more widely spaced netting that won't trap the heat. And that's great to use in the summer. Um, and that will even exclude thing, tiny things like, uh, like the Swede midge. There's different, um, there's different, what's the word I'm looking for? They call them weights, but like the size of the holes that the netting leaves. Um, so for Swede midge, you need some pretty fine holes. Um, I think that it's 25 weight, 25 gram weight that they recommend there. Um, but there's many options out there. <clears throat> it's also really important to just store your crop residues promptly at the end of the season. Um, most of the, um, of the diseases and some, several of the pests that I mentioned will overwinter on your crop residues. So for example, in this picture on the bottom left, that kale residue, there could be tons of alternaria on those plants. There could be cabbage aphids hanging out in there. Um, so best case scenario is to mow that residue and bury it um, on, even on commercial scales or larger scales. Um, in the late fall, it can be hard to kill things under in time. So mowing is better than nothing. Um, and then if you're on like a garden size scale, um, removing that residue just from the garden um, and getting it into like a proper composting system that's going to get warm enough or just getting it out of your garden um, can only help. <clears throat> And then a few notes about chemical controls um, overall. Um, organic chemical controls for all crops, but true also for brassicas, um, are most effective if they're applied early and often. Um, so that involves scouting your crops regularly to take note of what um, pests are showing up when so that you can be ready to apply an appropriate um, pesticide um, early on to catch it. <clears throat> And then specifically with brassicas, um, brassicas have really waxy leaves. So when you spray liquid on them, the liquid tends to bead up and roll off. Um, but there are materials called spreader stickers um, that are often recommended on product labels. And they help the water droplets or liquid droplets um, flatten out on the leaf and then also stick to the surface. Um, so they don't, so you're not losing all the material that you just sprayed. Um, so we always recommend using a spreader sticker on brassicas. Um, unless it's recommended otherwise by the label. <clears throat> so that's the end of the brassica section. Maybe, Rosemary, if there's um, any easy questions, not easy questions, but <laughs> questions ready to go in the chat. Quick um, questions. Maybe, maybe one. Uh, yep, there's one from, uh, I know, Barth, you asked a couple, and I will get to those a little bit later on. They're, they're a bit more um, general. One, there are two quick ones. One is um, about neem oil. Has anyone used that against alternaria? So is that a possibility? Neem oil is a product that is uh, mostly an insecticide. And I mentioned the product azadiractin several times. Azadiractin is uh, 
uh, not extracted, what's the word, um, like purified from neem oil. So one of the, there's two kind of ways that neem oil works. Um, one is that there is azadiractin within neem oil naturally. So it has some insect growth regulator properties to it. Um, and then because it's an oil, it will smother the insects. Um, so insects breathe, uh, get like have gas exchange through little holes in their exoskeleton. And if you smother those holes with oil, they die. Um, so that's a, a secondary mode of action of neem oil, but mostly effective as an insecticide. And it can be great for, um, for things like cabbage aphids as well. And then there was also a question, can covering your beds with a tarp kill some of these pests or diseases in the same way it would kill weeds? That's a great question. Um, my guess is that yes, that would, they, that would have some effect on them. I don't know details though. I don't wanna, I would, don't wanna promise that yes, if you tarp, you'll kill all of your cabbage aphids. I would have to look into that more specifically pest by pest. Um, but definitely if whoever asked that, if they want more info on that, they can definitely reach out um, afterwards. Cool. Yeah. And keep on putting questions in. Um, I'm gonna go on to, uh, no, nightshades now, um, but all crops keep on putting questions in. And even if we don't have time to get to all of them at the end, I'm happy to, um, in whatever way I can, answer any questions. Thank you. Cool. <clears throat> okay, so next up is nightshades. <clears throat> Again, I'll talk about a bunch of pests that we see every year. Mixed in there is one um, new pest, new disease, gray leaf spot that we saw a bunch of this year. Um, and then again, at the end, I'll talk about some overarching pest management recommendations. Um, okay, so there, I'm gonna start off with some fungal leaf spots. Um, these are all gonna be in tomato, um, but we see these every year. So the first one is early blight, um, importantly different from late blight, um, but early blight is caused by alternaria as, as well. It's a different species than the alternaria that affects brassicas. Um, so as I said before, there's kind of an alternaria for everything, <laughs> um, but it uh, behaves pretty similarly to the one on brassicas. So it causes those leaf spots that have the, the target spot appearance, those concentric rings, and the spores look the same, that Michelin man spore. Um, and early blight usually starts in the lower leaves of the plant and then moves upward as the season progresses that's a very common pattern that we see. It's a similar pattern that we see with septoria leaf spot, which is this next one. Um, and they can look very similar. And we often see septoria and early blight on the same plant in the same field. Um, it's very common. Septoria leaf spot um, produces spots that are much smaller. So often there'll be a bunch of tiny spots on one leaf that all kind of coalesce into a, into a brown, crunchy, blighted leaf. Um, and then if on a good day, <laughs> if you look at one of those small leaf spots, you can often see tiny little black pinpricks within that spot. And those are the fungal fruiting body structures that are producing the spores for that fungus, which is a fun little fact. Um, but septoria will also start in the lower leaves and move upward as the season progresses. So it's very common um, to see tomato plants where the lower leaves are yellow with spots. Um, and eventually they fall off. And usually that is caused by e and either or set, uh, early blight or septoria. Um, leaf mold is the next one here. This one we most commonly see in high tunnels. I'm not sure how many folks on are growing in high tunnels, but if you do, you have probably seen this disease. It causes these yellow blotches on the tops of the leaves and then under, underneath on the underside, um, it, it causes or it produces this kind of gray olive green sporulation. It's very fuzzy, very distinctive, so it's hard to miss. Um, but usually we only see that one in high tunnels. And lastly, this is the new one that we see, saw a bunch of last year. This is called gray leaf spot. It's caused by uh, several species of the fungus stemphilium. Um, notably, it doesn't necessarily start in the lower leaves. What we saw last year was that it would just kind of affect the plant top to bottom um, at the same time. 
It causes fairly irregular shaped um, brown spots on the leaves. Um, and sometimes they have this gray sporulation within that spot. Um, I didn't have a great picture of that to include, um, but that's what gives it the name gray leaf spot. And our theory with this is that it's probably been around at low levels um, for the last several years or many years. It's very common in the Southern US um, where it's a bit warmer. <clears throat> and then with the rain this year, with, with such wet weather, um, it just took off and was all over the place. Um, yeah, surprisingly. <laughs> Um, and importantly, um, for especially for early blight and leaf mold, there are great resistant varieties against these leaf spot diseases. And that is often the best way to control them most effectively, especially on small scales um, where you can't get in there or don't want to get in there to spray um, fungicides. Um, and they work really well. I have a picture um, on the management slide of an example of how well resistant varieties work. So it's a good thing to pay attention to, to ask your seed reps about. Um, in most seed catalogs online, there's ways of filtering for um, different disease resistance. So you should be able to look at all the tomatoes and then filter so that you're only seeing ones that are resistant to early blight, for example. Um, and it's a great technique to um, maybe not grow only resistant varieties, but to include one um, or two in your mix so that you can maybe have some of the more interesting heirloom varieties that you or maybe your customers want to see earlier in the season, but you know you have some resistant varieties that will persist throughout the season um, so that you can have some fruit later in the season as well. So that brings us to late blight. You can't talk about nightshade diseases without talking about late blight. And this is like the star bad boy of, <laughs> of plant diseases maybe, late blight is. Um, I will note that we haven't seen late blight in uh, several years in the Northeast or in Massachusetts, I guess I should say. Um, we had the last like really bad outbreak that we had was in 2014. And the last reported occurrence at all um, was in 2017 in Massachusetts. So there, we do have a monitoring network for late blight <clears throat> throughout the Northeast. Um, and for several years, it was real bad. We were seeing a lot of late blight every year. So this is a map. Oh, you can't see my pointer. But the map on the top <laughs> is uh, a map from that monitoring network that shows all of the um, reports, uh, confirmed reports of late blight in the region. So for several years, it looked like that 2011 map where it was all over the place. We were seeing a lot of late blight. Um, but the last several years, um, the map has looked pretty much like that 2021 uh, map below, where there's just a few reports that are stay isolated. They don't spread widely, um, even though it was super wet last year. So it's great. It's great that we seem to have gotten this disease um, under control. It's definitely one that we still keep our ears open for. Um, and Every year we do get a few suspected reports that maybe don't turn out to actually be late blight. So if you suspect it on your farm or in your garden, you're definitely welcome to reach out to us um, and we can help confirm um, that it is or isn't late blight. And that can definitely give you some peace of mind if it isn't late blight, which is nice. Um, um, and I guess I didn't say anything about what late blight is, but it's a pretty severe foliar and fruit blight of tomatoes and potatoes. Um, and it moves through a plant really quickly. So that's why it's particularly devastating. Um, and it overwinters in the south and moves up every year um, as the weather becomes warmer. The spores are spread on wind, but another really important means of transport for late blight um, is transplants. So often it's on transplants that are produced by some of the larger distributors. They move up from the south. And then if there's infected transplants, they get kind of spread out into home gardens and farms. And it is a very effective way, <laughs> very effective way for the disease to, to get spread around. So it's good to keep an eye out, especially if you're buying transplants, make sure you're checking them out and they, and, and they don't have any symptoms on them. There are some resistant varieties um, for late blight, which is also a nice um, management tool there. <clears throat> Switching gears to a bacterium for a moment, um, this is another disease that can be quite devastating in tomatoes, uh, bacterial canker. <clears throat> um, 
the bacteria can be carried on seed. Um, and then that seed can also produce, again, infected transplants, um, which can spread the, the disease around. Um, if the disease starts uh, from seed in your plants, it can cause some pretty nasty cankering on the stems, um, like in the bottom right-hand corner there. Um, the plants will be wilted and just kind of generally fail to thrive. It can cause uh, fruit spots. You can see a picture down there on the bottom left. Um, and then once there's an infected plant, it can spread from there um, through water or people moving through the crop, um, especially if you're pruning in a high tunnel, it can spread on pruning equipment. <clears throat> and uh, a plant that becomes secondarily infected, so um, not from the seed, but just from the bacteria moving around, they often develop this marginal leaf burn. So it just looks like the edge of the leaf has gotten scorched. That's a common symptom. <clears throat> Um, another important source of the bacteria can be tomato stakes, the poles that folks use to, um, to trellis tomatoes. Um, so if, if you have an infested crop, the bacteria can get onto those stakes and then overwinter on the stakes. And if you reuse them the next year, you can infect your crop again. So if you do have an outbreak, um, and for example, you reach out to Extension and we confirm that it's bacterial canker, um, a lot of the control recommendations that we'll make have to do with sanitation. So getting rid of those stakes and getting new ones or finding some way to sanitize them if possible, um, getting rid of as much crop residue as possible or really mowing it and getting it tilled under, <clears throat> um, things like that can, can help control this disease. Um, and then if you do catch it early enough and you are using pesticides, copper is the most effective material again, um, but again, it can be a tricky one to control. Um, even with copper, you have to catch it very early. <clears throat> um, this is another disease. We're swinging back to a fungus. Um, this is verticillium wilt. We see this most commonly in eggplant, and it's very common. Um, verticillium is a fungus that uh, lives in the soil. Um, and when a susceptible crop is planted into that soil, the fungus will invade the roots and invade the vascular system of the plant. So it causes a wilt. Um, oftentimes it will first just cause one side of the leaf to wilt. So you can see in the picture on the left, um, one side of that leaf is really wilted and the other one is mostly fine uh, still. Um, but other times it causes more just of a, a, a general wilt or like this funny modeling appearance to the leaves. That's also pretty common. Um, but it causes wilt um, and it can significantly reduce yield. Um, in the crop. Um, there's no effective chemical control. It lives in the soil for a super long time, so it's, it's hard to avoid. Um, and there's no truly resistant varieties, but there are varieties um, that will continue to produce good yields, even if the plants become infected. Um, so there's a few varieties listed there. To be fully honest, I'm not sure that that list is totally up to date and all of those <laughs> varieties still exist. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, but it's a good thing to pay attention to on your farm or in your garden. If you know that you have verticillium wilt um, and you grow several varieties, it's good to pay attention to which ones continue to produce well um, and versus which ones really just uh, poop out real fast because um, you'll notice differences even in your own production. <clears throat> okay, so I think I'm, I have two insect pests to talk about in tomatoes or in nightshades. Um, the first uh, is probably the most devastating insect pest of nightshades, and that is Colorado potato beetle. Um, there's an adult on the top left, um, this kind of beautiful striped beetle um, laying eggs. They lay eggs in clusters. The eggs look similar to lady beetle eggs, um, and they're usually on the undersides of leaves. <clears throat> and I should say that Colorado potato beetle mostly um, feeds on potato and eggplant sometimes on tomato, but mostly potato and eggplant. <clears throat> so their eggs are on the undersides of leaves in these clusters. When they hatch out, all of the young larvae tend to stay in a nasty little goober <laughs> cluster, like in that picture up on the right. Um, and then as they grow and begin to feed, they get, they <laughs> still are gross, <laughs> but much bigger. Um, and they move throughout the plant and, and feed. The adults will overwinter um, in field edges or in the field, so they'll burrow into the ground um, a ways um, to avoid the freezing temperatures. 
Um, and then in the spring, when things warm up, they move into the field. Um, they are beetles, so they can fly, but they're very bad flyers. It needs to be really warm in order for them to be able to fly. So mostly they walk, um, which means that they don't they don't move very far because it they're they're pretty small and it takes a while to walk. <clears throat> um, but the adults will emerge usually in around late May um, and walk into fields and find some new hosts. Um, and then those eggs will hatch and the larvae will feed on the crops. Um, and then we usually see a second generation of adults emerging in late June. Um, and that will result in another flush of eggs and larvae. <clears throat> um, there are several cultural control techniques that can um, pretty effectively control Colorado potato beetle. Um, because the beetles are such poor flyers and because they don't move very far, crop rotation can be very effective, especially if you're in an isolated area so that you can rotate away from other people's uh, potatoes and eggplant also. Can be a bummer if you rotate, <laughs> rotate your crop far away from where you had eggplant and potatoes, but you move to where your neighbor had eggplant and potatoes the year before. That can be a bummer because then you get their Colorado potato beetle. Um, on small scale production, um, it's it's often most effective to just hand squish these guys. Um, it can be a little gross, so a good alternative is with a, a bucket of soapy water, just knocking them into the bucket. Um, and it's usually easiest to get the adults um, and the eggs and when the larvae are really small because they're in that cluster. <clears throat> um, if you get it on early enough, row cover can definitely exclude these guys. So like as soon as you plant your eggplant, um, as soon as you have your potatoes planted, getting row cover on. One note of caution with that is that if you are, for example, in your home garden and you can't rotate because it's too small, um, you want to make sure that you're not covering um, plants that are planted where there might be Colorado potato beetle overwintering um, because those beetles will emerge from the soil underneath your row cover and will be happy as clams in that nice warm environment feasting on your uh, plants um, happily. <laughs> um, so that's something to be careful of. Um, but there's also been shown, uh, it's been shown to be effective um, to use some physical barriers to keep the adults from finding your crops. So things like um, mulching with straw around plants, um, the adults just kind of get caught up in the straw and can't get into your plant. Um, and then digging trenches around your crop uh, with the idea that the beetles kind of fall in and can't get out very well. Um, that's another thing that has been recommended. Um, and then for folks who um, are maybe on a larger scale and don't want to spend the time um, hand, hand picking or hand squishing, um, we did hear of some growers this past year who were experimenting with just attaching a bar to the back of a tractor and, and going through the field and just knocking the larvae off of the plants. Um, and they can't really crawl that well um, on the ground. So once they're knocked off of the plants, um, they just kind of stayed there. Um, so that's an interesting tactic as well. I'll say, say a few more notes about chemical control for this one than for the others, um, because it can be tricky with uh, CPB. <clears throat> because the beetles don't move very far, um, the CPB that you have um, on your farm or in your garden, are they're yours. <laughs> they're yours forever and always. Um, so if you're using pesticides, you're treating that same population kind of over and over again. So uh, resistance to insecticides can develop pretty quickly. Um, so there's some, some rules and tactics around um, applications that can help with that. Um, you do wanna target the smallest larvae. Um, so like in that picture on top there. Um, and that's because the most effective material um, is in trust, which is the spinosad material that has to be eaten um, in order to be effective. Um, and so the amount of of uh, and trust and leaf material that a small little larva has to eat in order to be killed is much smaller than the amount that one of those big honking larvae have to eat in order to be killed. And by the time one of those big guys eats enough uh, product to be killed, it will have still eaten a lot of your plant. So you wanna target the small guys. Um, there are some limitations around the amount of spinosad that you can apply 
um, per season per crop um, on your farm or in your in your production system. Um, so there are some secondary materials that can be effective if you need more applications. So azadiractin, that's that growth regulator. Um, pyrethrin, which is most often known as pyganic. Um, it's a contact insecticide, so it will kill whatever it hits. Um, Bovaria bassiana is a biocontrol, it's a, it's a fungus. Um, and uh, those are good options um, if you need something else as well. There was, uh, for anyone who, who was aware of this, there was a BT product called Trident that was labeled for Colorado potato beetle. It was OMRI approved. It had formulation issues, so it was like gloopy in the bottle. Um, and so they took it off the market, but we're hoping that it's going to be back soon because it is great to have another tool in the toolkit for sure. <clears throat> okay. Um, I believe this is the last pest I'll talk about with nightshade, and that's hornworms, which is often a, a, a big concern with smaller scale growers <clears throat> because you have relatively few plants, and these guys can eat a lot of material. Um, so there's two species of hornworms. Um, there's a tobacco and a tomato hornworm. I think all of these pictures I have up are of a tobacco hornworm, actually, which is, I don't think I've ever actually seen a tomato hornworm. Um, the tobacco hornworms have a red spike and tomato hornworms have a dark blue spike on their tail, or I guess I should call it a horn because that's what their name is. Um, they're often hard to see in your crop and often the first thing that you'll see is their poop or their frass. Um, they make a lot of it and it's big. So often you'll see that and then you'll kind of go follow upward and see this caterpillar hanging out on top. Um, the adults are these really beautiful moths, actually these very large moths called hawk moths. Um, but the caterpillars are really pests and they eat a lot of foliage. They can eat fruit as well, take big bites out of them. Um, chemical control is not usually warranted for these guys. There's usually relatively few of them in a crop doing the damage. So if you can find them and physically get them out of there or maybe cut them in half with scissors, gross, but effective. Um, that is usually the most effective way to deal with them. Um, something great um, that I wanna mention is that you may have seen this in your crops. Um, there is a natural biocontrol agent um, that's effective against hornworms, and it's just naturally out in the environment. It's a braconid wasp, a tiny little wasp, um, and they lay their eggs within the hornworm, and those eggs hatch out, and the larvae develop within the caterpillar, and then they create these little white pupae on the outside of the caterpillar. So if you are hand picking and hand killing um, hornworms in your garden or in your crops, if you see these guys that are parasitized, don't kill them, just let them be um, it can be, they can still eat a lot of uh, foliage <laughs> while they're infected. So it can be a good idea to just like take them off of your crop and put them on the ground somewhere or outside of your garden somewhere um, so that the wasps can complete their life cycle, but you don't get more damage. <clears throat> okay, so a few notes about some general nightshade pest management. Um, I think I mentioned a lot of these as I went, but I'll repeat them. Um, there are some great resistant varieties up there, um, and you guys will get um, uh, a copy of this slide deck. Um, so there's a link there to a great resource um, put together by Meg McGrath at Cornell Extension. <clears throat> um, she compiles lists of resistant varieties, um, like from all the seed catalogs, all in one place. So it's a great resource. It's for all crops. Um, and oh, and here's a picture. It's a little hard to see with the color in this picture, but this is in a high tunnel. Um, and you can see the bed on the right um, is covered, in this case, in leaf mold. So those leaves are crunchy. They are covered in disease. There's some green tissue up top, um, but that crop is going down fast. But the bed on the left is totally unaffected um, and is green and lush, and that is going to keep on going for a while. So resistant varieties really work well. They're a great tool um, to have in your pocket for sure. <clears throat> um, as with all crops, crop rotation is important. So getting an area out of um, the nightshade family or whatever crop family uh, for two to three years if possible is great. Um, again, avoiding um, working in your fields or, or tunnels when foliage is wet to prevent spreading some of those foliar diseases. 
Um, as I said, for Colorado potato beetle, um, using row cover um, on young plants is pretty effective. Um, and hand squishing uh, both Colorado potato beetle and the hornworms is a good is a good tactic. So maybe if there's if there's a faster question or a briefer question about tomato pests, we can do some of those. Yes, um, I think there was a previous question from um, that came right at the end of the uh, Nebraska portion of the talk, and that was: Are pre-emergent soil drenches effective for these pests? And I think that may have referred to brassica pests, but brassica pests. So let me think about brassica pests, flea beetles, caterpillars. I don't, off the top of my head, nothing comes to mind as like the best effective OMRI listed, like organic allowed uh, soil drenches, but I'm probably forgetting something. So that's a great question. Um, there, uh, we did do a lot of work. This is kind of tangentially related. I don't wanna to go too far off, but we did, there's been a lot of interest in looking at um, nematodes for various um, like soil, soil dwelling insect control. Uh, we did a lot of research on looking at that for flea beetle control in brassicas with the idea that the larval stage of flea beetles um, is under the soil um, and theoretically nematodes could target that stage. We could never get it to work. We tried it a bunch of different years. Um, there's just so many flea beetles out there coming in from the outside always um, that it, we could never get it to work. So I know that's not exactly the question, <laughs> but I guess the answer to that soil soil drenched question is I would have to look into it more. Um, there's also a, a question about, I think it was in reference to back, the bacterial canker, the really, um, yeah. One was for metal steak, tomato steaks, what's the best way to sanitize and avoid possible reinfection? And then someone also asked whether this applies to the tomato cages as well. Good questions. It would definitely apply to tomato cages as well. You definitely don't need to sanitize just like right off the bat always unless you're sure that you have bacterial canker um, because it's not such an important uh, management strategy for other diseases. But if you're sure that you have had bacterial canker, um, you can treat uh, steaks. Metal is definitely easier to treat than wood, um, but with, uh, with a chlorine solution. Um, and if anyone out there has had, I don't know the rate right off the top of my head, um, but if anyone out there has had issues with bacterial canker, definitely reach out to us and we can send um, specific rate information. There's some great resources out there. Awesome. Um, yeah. And one, uh, one more um, yeah. is, and uh, I've had other, I've had someone else actually ask me this um, about other tomato diseases, but is it okay to compost nightshades that have um, signs of disease or can, do they need to be like removed and destroyed? That's a very good question. Um, and it's hard to have a definitive answer. My, my go-to answer is maybe if you have a compost pile that is truly composting, like it's getting warm enough um, and it's not just like a rotting pile, um, that is probably effective. Um, especially uh, the, a lot of the diseases that I talked about with, with uh, tomatoes, um, Mostly the main source of those diseases is like windborne spores from everywhere. Um, like even if you have no early blight in your soil at all, um, you're probably still gonna get early blight because there's just so many spores out in the environment. So if you have a composting pile that's truly composting and working well, I would say it's fine to put them in the compost. Um, if it's more of like a cull pile, it can be dangerous um, and you can be getting like tomato volunteer plants growing up out of there that are infected and can be not great. But yeah. that's a great question, yeah. Um, just one more final, it's a tomato specific question. Oh, yeah. so, um, and then there, I, I know folks have asked a few others. I'm, I'm just gonna save them until the end, um, but I have, I promise you have seen them. Um, uh, there was one I think from Chris, Christine uh, or Christy, to what extent do these previously only Southern diseases arrive in New England via tomato seedlings shipped to big box distributors? Do you know the answer to that? I don't know how often, I guess that's, um, yeah, that's hard to say how often, but it definitely happens. It was definitely a several situations where that happened with late blight in years past, um, where it was like traced back in that way. Um, it's kind of the name of the game where these diseases do overwinter in the Southern US and a lot of them 
will move up naturally as the as the spring and summer warms in the northeast. Um, and so oftentimes they'll show up anyways, but they can be, yeah, like moved more quickly on transplants. Um, so there is definitely like a big responsibility for those producers and distributors, um, but it's also just good as, as growers to be aware of that so that when you're buying, just for like your own personal responsibility and success of your production, um, if you're buying transplants, look at them closely and, and make sure they're good quality. Um, and I'll say this at the end also, but um, a great way to avoid just being part of that whole like disease movement issue um, is to buy transplants local. There's so many great local farms that produce like great high quality transplants. Um, and there could be, you, you can have disease issues up here with, with, with transplants produced up here, but at least then you know you're not <laughs> bringing in late late from Florida um, on those plants. <clears throat> All right, we have several others, but I'm gonna, I'll save them for cool. later. Sounds good. <laughs> We've got a whole other crop group to go through, you guys. <laughs> These are great questions, so. Okay, so the last full crop group that I'll talk about is two curbits. <clears throat> so several, mostly diseases, but a few insect pests, um, and then some pest management. <clears throat> Let me just grab a drink real fast. Okay, so the first one I'll talk about is cucurbit downy mildew. Um, there's many downy mildews out there um, caused by different species. Um, all downy mildews uh, are host specific, it's called. So for example, cucurbit downy mildew only infects cucurbits. There is a basil downy mildew, there's a spinach downy mildew, there's a lettuce downy mildew, and all of those downy mildews only infect their crop that they're named for. They don't cross over. Um, but it can be confusing when everyone's talking about downy mildew all the time. <clears throat> they are all oomycete diseases, so that fungal-like organism. Um, and cucurbit downy mildew causes leaf lesions on the leaves, um, and it can lead to some pretty severe defoliation. Um, the lesions uh, on the top of the leaf are yellow, and they're, they're notably angular shaped. They, um, they get trapped, the fungus or the, the oomycete gets trapped by the veins of the leaf. Um, so it ends up looking this like this angular pattern. Um, and then on the underside of the leaf, the pathogen produces like fuzzy uh, gray colored sporulation. Um, and that sporulation is only on the underside of the leaf. <clears throat> um, the disease has some pretty complex genetics. Um, and, but, uh, and so it infects different cucurbit crops dif uh, differently. There's different strains that infect different crops. But long story short, we see it earliest and most commonly in the Northeast on cucumber. So when you're keeping an eye out for this disease, watch your cucumbers. <clears throat> um, the, the symptoms can look slightly different on different crops. So the picture in, on the top right is on cucumber. Um, and then down below is um, how it looks on butternut squash, a little more flat, a little more velvety. Um, and then the picture on the bottom left is a microscopy picture. Um, the, and that's the sporulation coming out of the bottom of the leaf. They look like these little trees covered in spores or little like grape clusters, um, <clears throat> which is interesting. Um, cucurbit downy mildew is an obligate parasite, which means that the pathogen needs a living host in order to survive. So that is different from some of the other um, diseases that I've mentioned already, where they will overwinter on crop residue in the field. Downy mildew doesn't do that. Um, so downy mildew overwinters in the southern U.S. in Florida, and then uh, and sometimes in like the Great Lakes region where there's a pretty significant um, greenhouse cucumber system. <clears throat> um, and then as the spring gets warm, the disease blows up. The eastern seaboard on storm fronts. Um, and we do have a moder monitoring system for cucurbit downy mildew um, so that as the disease moves up the coast, as the risk increases um, for growers, we can alert them so that they can protect their uh, crops in whichever way they see fit. <clears throat> so we usually see it in New England, um, usually in early August. Um, some years it's a little earlier, some years a little later. So it's mostly affecting late summer cucumber production. 
Um, and there are some great resistant varieties out there. So I've listed a bunch here. Um, and I'll say that uh, we on the UMass vegetable program um, have been doing uh, variety trials looking at downy mildew resistant cucumbers uh, for many years now. And we've helped identify some of these varieties as good ones for the Northeast. And there's always more in the pipeline. So resi resistant varieties are a great tactic to use for, for cucumber downy mildew, um, especially if you're growing successions of cucumbers um, for your later season successions. <clears throat> um, I will contrast that guy with powdery mildew, which is, I, it's, I know it's confusing to have a downy mildew and a powdery mildew. It sounds exactly the same, but they're different diseases. <clears throat> powdery mildew is a true fungus, not an OMIC. Um, and it causes, again, these leaf spots that can lead to very severe defoliation. Here's a picture of some very advanced powdery mildew in cucumber where the leaves just turn to crisp. <clears throat> Um, the, you can distinguish it from downy mildew um, because powdery mildew causes these powdery looking <laughs> uh, fungal growths um, on the bottom and the tops of the leaves, whereas downy mildew, um, it's more gray colored and it's only on the bottom of the leaf. Um, and in addition to causing uh, the defoliation and the leaf spots um, in pumpkins, um, infection by powdery mildew can lead to poor handle development, which isn't great if you're growing jack-o'-lanterns, everyone wants their little stem. Um, but the spores are very easily windborne. Um, the fungus does require a living host to survive, and we're not sure how it arrives in the Northeast every season. Um, we're not sure the source of it, but it's super common. We usually see it show up in June or July, so before downy mildew. Um, and again, there's great resistant varieties for powdery mildew. Um, and a good, a helpful note for that is when you're looking at varieties um, in the catalog or online, the, the acronym PMR stands for powdery mildew resistant. And that's often in variety names. Um, so usually it's included in the description as well, but it's a good thing to look out for if you're looking for, for powdery mildew resistance um, in cucumbers or winter squash or butternut, anything. <clears throat> So Phytophthora blight is another very devastating disease of cucurbit crops. Um, it causes a fruit rot and a crown rot. So it can cause fruit to rot, but it can also infect the roots and the base of the plant and kill the whole plant. It affects all cucurbits um, and it also infects peppers and tomato. So in peppers, it can cause a fruit and crown rot. And then in tomato, it causes something called buckeye rot where it um, affects the fruit and makes them look this weird leathery appearance to them. <clears throat> um, it, uh, because it can rot the fruit and the crown, it can be very devastating to crops. Um, but it's also particularly devastating because in certain scenarios, it can produce a certain type of spore that survives in the soil for a super long time, like 10 years, more than 10 years, very long time. So if that happens, um, there's two different mating types of Phytophthora blight. Um, and if they're both present in the same field, then they produce these OO spores, they're called. Um, and if that happens, uh, it sucks. <laughs> Basically, you have phytophthora blight for a, a long time on your farm. So the best management tactic for phytophthora blight is really to avoid introducing it onto your farm. Um, so that means if you're sharing equipment with another farm or garden, and you know that they have phytophthora blight, which they, they should know, they probably know if they do, um, making sure you're cleaning that equipment um, and not carrying any soil um, between locations. If you know that you have Phytophthora blight on your farm, um, taking care to get rid of um, fruit, infected fruit um, from that field so that it's not going to infest other fields. Um, and thinking about um, this pathogen is moved through water. Um, so uh, thinking about where water is moving on your farm so that if you potentially have an infested field, um, water isn't gonna move that pathogen um, to, un to clean fields, basically. Um, because once you get it, once it's established on your farm, there's, there's, uh, it's really hard to control even um, with pesticides. So it's a tricky one. So this is one if you're struggling with, I would definitely recommend reaching out to us because there can be some nuances to providing um, the best recommendations for this one. 
This is another disease that's not quite as devastating, but I wanted to mention it because we saw um, a lot of it this last year with the rainy season. This is Plectosporium blight. Um, it causes these white lesions, kind of long shapes um, on stems and petioles and on the fruit. It's very common on winter squash and zucchini, um, and it's kind of a classic fungus. It will live in the soil, it'll survive on your crop residue, it likes wet weather. Um, there aren't any effective OMRI listed chemical controls, um, so mostly you have your crop rotation to manage this um, and avoiding uh, planting into wet spots where this disease might be thriving. <clears throat> All right, a few insect pests of cucurbits. Um, definitely the most prevalent one is striped cucumber beetle. There's a picture of the adults there on the right. Um, these guys will cause uh, pretty significant direct feeding damage um, to all cucurbits. Um, they, uh, they eat a lot of plant material and can really take out especially small plants, but they will also uh, vector a bacterium um, that causes a disease called bacterial wilt. Um, and there is some variability in susceptibility of different cucurbits crops to bacterial wilt. Uh, so cucumbers, cantaloupes, summer squash, and zucchini are more susceptible to that bacterial wilt than other, than other cucurbits. Um, and I'll say a bit more about bacterial wilt on the next slide as well. Uh, but the striped cucumber beetles overwinter in field edges. They overwinter up here in the Northeast, um, and they'll come out and invade your crops in June. Um, similarly to the flea beetles in brassicas, these guys lay their eggs at the soil line and then the larvae feed on plant roots. Um, there's two generations of adults per year, but mostly once the adults have emerged in June, they're, they're out and about and doing damage all season long. Um, and if you are using chemical controls, uh, these guys are tricky to control with chemical controls because they fly really well. <clears throat> So if you're going through with a sprayer, they tend to anticipate you and just fly away before you can hit them. Uh, but pyrethrin, uh, which is the contact insecticide, most commonly known as pyganic, um, is usually the most effective. And then again, that kale and clay material will effectively deter these guys, especially from young transplants um, that are easy to treat with that clay. So a few more things about bacterial wilt. Most of this I already said. Um, but there's a picture of the wilt on the top there. Um, the whole plant just kind of collapses. Um, and the important thing I'll say here is that there is no specific uh, control for bacterial wilt. Um, so to control bacterial, bacterial wilt, you have to control striped cucumber beetles. Um, there's nothing you can do specifically to get rid of the wilt um, or prevent the wilt except for making sure that the beetles aren't in your crop. <clears throat> there is another insect pest of cucurbits that can cause a very similar um, wilt uh, damage, um, and that is squash vine borer. So it's good if you're seeing symptoms like this to look for squash vine borer as well. This is squash vine borer. Um, it's a patchy pest, so some people have it and some people don't. Um, there can be like one farm that or garden that, that really struggles with squash vine borer and then a neighbor that has never seen it in their, in their crops. Um, but it is a moth, so the adult is a moth. There's a picture up there in the top right corner. It's a, it's a funky looking moth. Um, it doesn't look like your average moth. It's a type called a clear wing moth. Um, it looks kind of more like a bee almost, uh, but they're moths. Um, and the adults lay eggs at the base of plants. So in the bottom right hand picture there, that's a young cucurbit plant. And then there's a single egg within that inside that red circle. Um, so they're very small and usually they're laid at the base of plants, but sometimes further out, I've seen a moth laying an egg on a leaf one time, um, but mostly they're at the base of the plants. Uh, when that egg hatches, the larva will bore into the stem and then live within the stem for the rest of its uh, maturation. So it'll eat within the stem, um, Characteristically, as it enters the stem and starts eating, it produces a lot of frass or poop. Um, so in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see some kind of sawdust-like material, um, and that's a sure sign that you have squash vine borer. So that's something that's good to check for. If you have a wilting plant, look at the base of the plant and look for that frass. 
Um, there is some variability in susceptibility to this pest. Um, they, they mostly like um, laying eggs on thick stemmed cucurbits, so things like zucchinis as opposed to cucumbers, things with big hefty stems, um, and bush type cucur cucurbits uh, as opposed to vining cucurbits are, are most um, drastically affected. Uh, these guys will come out in late June and start laying eggs. Um, sometimes they're, if, if it's a warm enough season, um, there'll be time for the, um, for the pest to mature fast enough that we'll see a second generation in the early fall. We didn't see that this year, just depends on the year. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, especially small scale control, if you're trying to control this guy like in your home garden, the kaolin clay can definitely um, prevent egg laying. The, um, the adults just get confused by it and don't like that surface covered in clay. And then we've heard lots of folks who use um, tin foil or even like toilet paper tubes cut down the side and then wrapped around the base of a plant just to prevent the moth from even reaching the base of the plant. And if you just have a few plants in a small, small garden, that's definitely a feasible tactic um, to use. Um, it's harder con to control on larger scale um, farms, um, but the most effective chemical control is in trust, the spinosad. Um, and again, if this is one that you struggle with, um, maybe so I don't run out of time here, it's a good one to reach out to us about because um, it can be tricky to control even if you're using chemicals. <clears throat> so that brings us to just a few points about some overarching cucurbit pest management. Um, with some of the diseases that I talked about, like Phytophthora blight um, and Plectosporium blight, um, you want to avoid planting in low spots where you might get pooling water um, because those diseases love the water and they'll, they'll proliferate there. Um, if you have Phytophthora blight and you know it, um, take measures to avoid spreading it either to other places on your farm or to other farms. Um, for powdery and downy mildews, Resistant varieties are really the way to go. They really provide great control. Um, and then for some of the insect pests or all of the insect pests I talked about, row cover can exclude those. Um, so that's a great tactic as well. Just remember to take off the row cover when your plants start flowering to allow for pollination. <clears throat> all right, so any questions about cucurbit pests that we can hit on right now? All right. Um, Thank you for all of that information. Um, and as Genevieve mentioned, the slides will be available so you can review. Um, and in fact, we um, have already put them into a materials folder. Uh, and I dropped the link earlier and I'll, I'll drop it again so you can find the slides. Um, I'm sure there are some cucurbit specific, um, but I'm just gonna start reading the ones that came up earlier. So one is- um, Well, Rosemary, before we get too far into questions, there's oh, a yeah. few more things that I can go through. I don't know what makes most sense. Um, okay. Um, Daniel, I just want to make sure I don't miss a cucurbit specific one. Uh, okay, oh, someone asked, just recently heard of using yellow cu cups filled with soapy water as an effective trap for uh, cucumber beetles and other similar pests. Are you aware of this trap? There has been some research done um, looking at trapping for striped cucumber beetles using yeah traps that have soapy water. The work that, that I've seen has included um, a lure for the for the beetles. So it's a lure that's produced. I'm not, I don't remember where it's produced, but I think it's a floral based lure. Like it has floral components in it. So it attracts the beetles um, and then they're killed. It those traps are they haven't been perfected yet. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend them across the board. Um, it's been they're more effective when you're when you can use um, a conventional not organic approved um, uh, pesticide in the trap to kill them, to kill the beetles once they enter. Um, the soapy water isn't always super effective, but we've had some issues also like getting a lot of bees in the traps and beneficial insects. So it's a tricky one. Um, it's, it's worth trying, especially on a, on a small scale if, if you have the time to experiment with stuff for sure. Um, but it definitely like as a general recommendation needs some fine tuning, I would say. Um, thank you. And uh, there are a, a couple questions about temperature. So one is, do below freezing temperatures in winter kill any of the 
mildews or blights in the soil, and that might uh, be broadly applied to cucurbits, but the other vegetables you mentioned too. Yeah, so in some cases, yes, specifically for cucurbits, um, the the downy mildew can't overwinter up here. Um, it it can't survive in the soil. It can't um, survive without a living cucurbit host. Um, so unless you have like a heated greenhouse with cucumbers in it, um, which sometimes is the case, like in the Great Lakes regions, they have some uh, some large production areas like that. Um, the pathogen can't overwinter up here, but it depends on the pathogen. Um, so um, things like in tomatoes, those most of those um, foliar diseases of tomatoes will overwinter in the soil on crop residue, and they don't mind being frozen. They're happy as clams. The spores are pretty resistant, um, and they can survive, unfortunately. Excellent. Okay. I'll let you continue, then we'll come back to the others. Sounds good. Okay, so there's just a few more pests that I wanted to include in here. Um, this is our miscellaneous section. Um, one emerging pest that's on alliums, a few more downy mildews. You're gonna get tired of me talking about downy mildews, but I'll try to be brief there. Um, and then a fun one to end on. So this is allium leaf miner. This is a new pest in the region, um, and it's definitely one that we're interested in tracking. Um, it hasn't been reported yet in all in, in every county in Massachusetts, but we suspect that it's probably out there. Um, so it's a good one to keep your eyes out for and let us know if you see it. <clears throat> um, this, it affects all allium crops, but it's often the most noticeable in fall weeks. Um, the pest is a fly, so the adult just looks like a house fly. Um, and the adult will uh, feed on the foliage and then lay the eggs in the foliage. So in that picture on the top uh, with the hand um, are a bunch of little marks all in a row. Those are feeding and, and egg laying marks. Um, and when the eggs within those spots hatch, the larvae will tunnel down into the onion bulb or into the scallion or, or leek or whatever crop it is. Um, and the larva will feed in there. And the feeding damage um, is obviously damaging, but also those wounds um, allow our entry points for potentially for bacterial diseases to get into your, into your allium crops. Um, so the, the larvae will feed in there and then either pupate within the crop um, or leave and pupate in the soil. Um, but often you might not notice this pest until you're like cooking your leeks um, because they can often be deep within the, the leek or the onion um, because each leaf of an allium crop corresponds to one layer of that leek or onion or whatever. Um, so if the eggs are laid in an inner leaf, then that larva will, will live its whole life within one of the inner layers um, of that bulb. So you often don't find them until you're cooking them or until your customer is cooking them, which is even worse. <laughs> uh, but there's two generations of this pest, one in the spring and one in the fall. Um, in the fall, it's usually most damaging on, on weeks because that, uh, by that time, that's the only green foliage of allium crops that's left in the field, most, most usually. Um, but in the spring, uh, uh, usually the pest is present too early to affect onion crops. Um, it's showing up in mid-April mid or mid-May, which is a little early for onions, but we see it often in like uh, perennial chive plants in folks' gardens. Um, or in onions that have overwintered, which is becoming a more popular practice. So those are good places to look for this pest in the spring, um, starting in, in mid-April. Um, there has been some great research out of Cornell looking at management of allium leaf miner. Um, row cover will effectively exclude allium leaf miner, which is great. Um, and looking at chemical controls, they've found that spinosad, the entrust, um, and insecticidal oil, so or insecticidal soap, excuse me, um, so the impede, um, applied two times, two to four weeks after you find those uh, feeding and egg laying marks in your crop. Um, that will provide the best control for this guy. <clears throat> so this is a big one that we want folks to be looking out for and letting us know if they suspect it in their crops. Uh, we, can help, we can help confirm identifications and it would be great to know if it's throughout Massachusetts or not yet. So really briefly, two, two other downy mildew pests 
that are nice to have on the radar. One is basal downy mildew. Um, so it's, it's has a similar pattern to the cucurbit downy mildew that we talked about. It uh, produces sporulation on the undersides of leaves. Um, that sporulation is trapped by the veins. So in this case, um, it produces these kind of stripes of yellowing and then sporulation um, on the leaves. Um, it's host specific to basil, as I said earlier, um, and the spores are very easily spread around. Um, there's great resistant varieties, again, for basil downy mildew. They won't totally prevent the disease, but they'll give you uh, several additional weeks of production. Um, so they're in great, to, great to include for late season basil. There's a bunch of varieties listed there, um, including that last bullet, Eleonora, Emma, and Everleaf are some older resistant varieties. So those don't offer the greatest resistance anymore. There's some better ones. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then an important lookalike of basil downy mildew is sunburn. Um, so we see this a lot, and we get a lot of reports of this in place of basil downy mildew. Um, and a dead giveaway that it's sunburn and not downy mildew um, is often with sunburn, there'll be a triangle of unaffected leaf at the base of the leaf where the younger leaf above it was shading it. So you'll often see that, that pattern that you can see in the picture there um, if it's sunburn. And sunburn is pretty common in basil, especially um, if it has been really cloudy for, for a long time and then suddenly we get a sunny day, um, the crop is pretty sensitive. There's also a spinach downy mildew. I'm keeping an eye on the time here and I don't wanna go, oh my goodness, we're already over. So I'm not gonna talk about this, but there's a basil downy, I mean a spinach downy mildew also. There's a downy mildew for everything. And then a fun one uh, to end on, uh, because it's not actually a pest, because it's not bad, is slime molds. The grossest name, but they're not bad. We had a lot of reports of these guys and questions about these guys this summer because it was so wet, um, but they just grow on surfaces. They can grow on pavement. They can grow on wood chips. They can grow on plants, um, and they eat bacteria and fungi, um, and then they produce these spore-producing spore structures when they're done. Um, so we had lots of folks asking about that this year, so I wanted to include them. Um, very briefly, I know we're already at time, but very briefly, I'll talk about some resources for pest ID. And again, you'll get these slides. The easiest way to get resources and answers is to contact us. We encourage commercial growers to contact us at the vegetable program. Um, and we encourage non-commercial growers to first go through the green info hotline at UMass. Um, they're often better equipped to answer some small scale questions, but you're always welcome. Anyone is always welcome to reach out to the vegetable program as well. We have a great plant diagnostic lab at UMass. I won't talk through this, but there's um, a link here to their website where they have great information. Angie Medeiros is our vegetable um, plant pathologist and she does a great job um, diagnosing plant diseases. And then we have several resource guides available for free. The links are there. There's a vegetable pest ID guide with pictures, as well as um, a, a very in-depth production guide, um, the New England Vegetable Management Guide that has fertility recommendations, variety recommendations, production recommendations, disease and insect control. It's, it covers everything. So it's great and it's available for free online. We all, <laughs> I just going on and on here, rapid fire. Please. I just want to um, interject for one minute. We we do have to vacate this Zoom room um, oh, yeah. in by Good. yeah shortly um, just for the next session. So um, I then I want to just fit in a, a few questions. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's jump to questions because you guys will have these slides, so you'll be able to see any resources that you're interested in. Thank you so much for this presentation. This was uh, just a, an amazing amount of information, and I'm actually. <laughs> to going I'm actually looking forward to going back through it listening to the talk again because um uh yeah anyway there's some things of particular interest to me but I uh to get to a few questions before we have to leave the room um but first of all if, if folks need to go please feel free um to leave uh, obviously this will be recorded and you can revisit um in the chat I also put an evaluation link we'd love to get your feedback there's also a link to the auction um uh, the marketplace and the workshop resources folder so thank you, everyone. Um, a couple of questions. Um, one is, is compost tea effective against any of the diseases and pests covered? And if so, are there instructions um, of how to make it effectively or where to get it? 
Compost tea, I wouldn't say is necessarily effective against any pests. Um, it can be, I think folks mostly use compost tea as a nutrient, um, a nutrient amendment for crops. Um, and providing proper nutrients to your crops is an important part of pest management because healthy, um, well-fertilized crops are uh, better set up to combat uh, diseases and pests. Um, but it isn't necessarily effective against, um, or compost tea isn't necessarily effective against any pests on its own. Got it. Um, and someone asked, do you have any experience with soil steamers and their ability to mitigate diseases and pests? That's a great question. I don't. There, um, Becky Madden, who works for UVM Extension, just did a little like on-farm trial of her own looking at soil steaming. Um, I think actually for weed control, there, people are starting to look at it. So I don't particularly have any experience with it, um, but it's an emerging topic. Um, and if you uh, subscribe to our newsletter, Veg Notes, I expect we'll probably put something out about soil steaming soon. So it's, it's definitely something that I think you'll be seeing more about um, in the next few years, for sure. Um, how do we avoid pest resistance to BT? What other options in rotation with Dipel to reduce risk of resistance? So we don't hear about uh, resistance developing with Dipel a ton. Um, there's certain types of insecticides just from their formulation and their chemical structure and what they target within the pest that um, just are more, uh, more, what's the word I'm looking for? It's more likely that um, pests will develop resistance to them. And BT isn't one that we hear about a lot, um, but in general, it's always good to be including several different types of pesticides in rotation with each other so that if you get resistance developing within a population of pests, you can use a different pesticides and knock out those ones that might've survived um, so you don't get disease uh, developing. But there's a bunch of different techniques to, to use to avoid resistance development. Um, and it could be its, its own whole talk, <laughs> own whole one and a half hour talk. Um, but there's definitely a bunch of techniques out there. And I'm definitely happy my email is up on the screen. So folks are definitely welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, I know we're running out of time, so. Yes, um, I, I know there were a few more. Unfortunately, we do have to vacate the room for the next um, folks to get in here and get set up. Genevieve, thank you so much for this talk. And thank you everyone for coming out today. Um, it, again, if you have any lingering questions, uh, Genevieve's email is there and you have the UMass um, extension information. I encourage you to reach out to them. Um, thank you and happy conferencing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. All right, bye.